Hello and welcome to the MOOC Tailored Materials and Enzymes for Industrial Processes. My name is Robert Kurist, and this is the fourth unit of the basic module and deals with rational protein design. In the previous units, I explained properties of enzymes. This can be selectivity or unique reactivity, or of course also the rate and stability. And all of these properties determine the success of a process. For instance, they influence the biocatalyst productivity, for instance, the activity, uh, the, the rate, and the stability, or they determine the volumetric productivity. Here we also have properties like um, low inhibitions. And all of these properties are encoded in the amino acid sequence. So the primary structure of an enzyme, the amino acid sequence, encodes the structure, so or, or decides on the structure. And the structure determines function. So it's also important to note that the relevant aspect of an enzyme is a structure, because a structure will determine the function. And this means for evolution, uh, structures have been optimized by evolution, um, by selection. And um, there are can be different sequences that, for instance, um, give rise to similar structures. So, uh, therefore, if we want to understand enzyme catalysis, we need to focus on structure and function. If we change the sequence, we modify, we change the structure, and this then, the altered structures, uh, might result in a different function. So, um, this is well understood. The problem is, it is still quite difficult to um, predict from a sequence a structure. And also, once we have a structure, for instance, we have a very good experimental structure or a very good prediction, very accurate prediction, then it's still exceedingly difficult to anticipate the function. So some aspects can be predicted, but for instance, I would say if we have an enzyme that uh, has a rate of one per second with a certain substrate, and we change an amino acid, for instance, here this histidine to tryptophan, it would be very, very difficult to predict the exact rate. So this is still not possible. And it is also important to know we have two levels of prediction here. Um, it is very difficult to predict the, sequ the, the, the changes of a sequence, the effect on a structure. So um, artificial intelligence gave us algorithms like AlphaFold or RosettaFold that can actually very accurately, in many cases, predict de novo structures without the need to determine them experimentally. But, for instance, the orientation of side chains is an issue um, the accommodation of a ligand and how this influences the structure. So um, experimental structures still have their value, and even then we get a static picture of an actually very dynamic protein. And this means it is still very, very difficult to, um, to predict how a change of amino acid sequence changes function. So I have worked with cases where the substitution of a leucine with methamine had a strong change in activity and it is very difficult if you look in a, in, in, in a, in a model. Leucine and methanol have very similar size and very similar activity to understand that. So our problem here is our, is our limited extent of understanding. So if we if we incorporate uh, a, a mutation in a certain site in the primary sequence, then we introduce a mutation and then we change the function. The question is, what happens here, and we are only as good as our hypothesis and, our, and, and as good as the accuracy of our predictions. So the second challenge is the vast combinatorial diversity and the many degrees of freedom we have. So if we look at a peptide of 10 amino acid and we try to investigate all possible mutations. So this means we incorporate 19 other amino acids in the first one. So we substitute the first amino acid with 19. Then we do it with the second one, the third, and the fourth, and so on. So this means we look at all single variants. It's quite easy, quite easy to calculate this. We have 10 times 19 amino acid. So there are top, there are 190 single mutants of a 10 amino acid peptide. Yeah? This is quite easy, but these are only the single mutants. So now if you want to look uh, at all double variants, then we have here, we have, we have, for instance, we put 90 amino acids here and 19 here, so we would have to look at 19 times 19, and to this we need to add 19 times 19 and 19 times 19, 
And this then gives us, if you if, if, we, if we push through with that, so on the second side, we have 19 by 19, 19 by 19, etc. And this gives us 16,245 double returns of a peptide of 10 amino acids. So if we look at larger peptide references, 200 or 300 amino acids, the, the, total, um, the total number of mutants is way beyond our capacity of investigation. And if we go for um, a rational approach where we make a targeted muta mutation, it is uh, still a huge amount of work and also possible to create 16,000 variants by side directed mutagenesis. So, if we look now on a peptide of a larger size, 200 amino acids, this is a typical enzyme. So, enzymes often have 200, 300, 400 amino acids. All single amino acid substitutions are 3,800. This is fair enough, and this is sometimes done. This is called gene size saturation mutagenesis to look at all single amino acids. The problem is, if we look into literature, successful protein engineer studies usually have more than one mutation. So there's sometimes two or three, sometimes up to 10, 20 amino acid mutations are necessary to tailor an enzyme that we want to have. So um, three, so all single amino acid mutations can give us some useful information, but certainly we will not achieve our objective. And as soon as we have all double mutations for 200 amino acids, we have uh, seven more than 7 million variants. And this is usually beyond our experimental screening capacities. And all triple or all quadruple variants are out of the question. So it's impossible to look at the full combinatorial variety. So it is clear that we will not be able to characterize all possible variants of a protein, not even all three or fourfold variants, and only perhaps in small enzymes all double mutations. But even this is a tremendous work, and often, also often it is not necessary. So there are two basic strategies how we can reduce the screening effort. And the first strategy is called rational protein design. So this works by, um, by introducing site directed mutagenesis, usually on the basis of a hypothesis. So we hypothesize if we exchange here an alanine to a thylamine, then this will change our the reactivity of the enzyme in a certain way. So we obtain this hypothesis based on structural considerations. Considerations. So usually we need a good structure and very good mechanistic knowledge. And sometimes we use molecular modeling, so computer computer simulations, or we use bioinformatic approaches, or um, we might use a very thorough enzymological characterization, or we have, or maybe we have knowledge from the mutation of similar enzymes. And we bring together all this knowledge, define hypothesis, then introduce a site of mutagenesis. This is a, a experiment which can be done in a very few in a few days. And then you see here chromatogram, we characterize the variants. So the whole cycle of from mutation to experiment here is a couple of days. And in a typical in a few months, we can actually investigate hundreds of variants, which is usually not done. Usually we are talking about tens of variants. And if we have a good understanding, we might get successful predictions on a qualitative level. So this can work fine if we understand our enzyme very well. And this is a bit of a challenge here because with interesting enzymes, enzymes that make interesting reactions, often they are new, and then we do not have years of experience. So this makes us difficult to make actual, uh, I would say, which makes successful guesses because this is still a lot of guessing, guessing and intuition involved here. On the other hand, there is an approach which is very consequent and says we will not investigate the full combinatorial diversity. We will just investigate a large number of randomly generated variants. And our hypothesis is that such a sequence space will contain improved variants. So I just told you that of a um, 200 amino acid protein, all fourfold variants. Uh, uh, that the sequence space is beyond our experimental our experimental capacities, but we can just but in direct evolution we just say okay let's just screen fifty thousand. So we we use a mutagenesis method by a random mutagenesis method like error prone PCR, and then we generate a set of fifty thousand variants, and we screen that in for instance microdata plates and high throughput screening for large uh, for our property, and the hypothesis is that there are a large number of improved variants. So already by screening 50,000, we will find some. And then by several, and then we take the best hit and we go on, randomize that one, and go on. And usually with five or six rounds, we find improved variants. So um, this approach, the, um, this approach was developed in the 1990s. 
And um, Francis Arnold received the Nobel Prize for the work on it, which demonstrates how successful this approach is. Um, there, it is, it is, it is actually an experimental challenge because we need a meaningful high throughput screening which tells us sufficient about our enzyme property, but still we can characterize thousands of variants in a week. This is still uh, quite challenging, but it can be also now with modern technology, even with um, chromatography methods and thousands of screens of, of clones can be screened every day. Um, there's a fundamental problem with this experiment. So if I generate of an enzyme, uh, let's say we, we, we um, use experimental conditions that produce like uh, fourfold mutations, and if I produce 50,000 fourfold mutations, so I find a few hits, I'm happy. Um, somebody else reproduces the same experiment, makes the same mutagenesis, and obtains, of course, different, a different set of 50,000, because the sequence space has billions. So, of course, this other person will find different hits. So, we have here a kind of experiment. If we do it twice, we will get different results. So, um, the basic assumption underlying direct evolution, or the basic principle is, I don't necessarily want to understand my system. So there can be, in science, we assume for every phenomenon, there's only one explanation. But it is, I want to have enzyme variants that have a certain selectivity or certain activities, so they need to suffice, um, to suffice certain, um, criteria, to fulfill certain criteria. And in any random sequence space of 50,000, I have a certain likelihood to find some of these variants. So this is here the assumption, and I do not un I do not want to understand the one variant which um, explains something. I just want to have a variant, one variant, which does the job. And therefore, I can live with the fact that this experiment might not be reproducible. And of course, what I do as a scientist, I characterize the variants very well. And, and, and this is then the reproducible result, the characterization of the obtained variant. So the name of this algorithm evokes evolution, evokes natural evolution. It is called direct evolution because we define the fitness function. It should not be confused with natural evolution. Natural evolution selects organisms. We select here enzymes. And natural evolution is a very complex process, whereas this here is a very simple, actually, and defined optimization process. So the name comes from uh, the fact that most of these mutants will offer incremental um, improvements, and usually the sum of 10 or 15 of these improvements give us a desired effect. So therefore we evolve, uh, so we have, an, we have an improvement by evolution instead of by revolution. Of course, evolution or evolutionary test tube sounds nice in the research proposal, but we should, not we should not confuse this with natural evolution. I would call direct evolution an optimization algorithm in, in a test tube. So now comes the question, um, which route should we choose? So one point here is the extent of understanding. If I have a very good understanding of my enzyme, then it is much easier to incorporate one cytotoxic mutation and then characterize it simply after production. This can be done in a few, a few days, and it takes weeks to establish a high-throughput assay. So on the other hand, for direct evolution, I need very... Um, very little understanding. So I can uh, I can already op optimize an enzyme where I have only the sequence and I have an idea of the reaction me mechanism and I have the gene of the enzyme available. So this is, uh, this is a very successful method if I have an incomplete knowledge. And I just told you for most enzymes, we do have only incomplete um, knowledge. The other point here is our screening capacity. So in a high, um, the method only works if I have a very powerful high throughput screening. And um, right now, people devise the experiment that in every round, for instance, they would screen five to 10,000 variants because this can be done already very efficiently if you have a very good HPC device or, for instance, if you have a handful of HPSE devices. And the other thing is, for many enzymes, we have very powerful screens, but there are also enzymes where there are no screens available and their direct evolution is still difficult. And then it is very important to choose the mutagenesis. These mutagenesis methods are done in experiments. So, for instance, erythrom PCR is a polymerase chain reaction, and they also have limitations. For instance, polymerases have a certain tendency to incorporate 
um, so some mutations and uh, suppress others. So for instance, we can either use one polymerase or it might also make sense to mix two polymerases to get more mutants. Then we can focus the entire gene or we can say we focus on a certain position or on two positions, but put in all aminoacids. So the choice of mutagenesis defines the sequence space that I investigate, and this then in, uh, defines the hits that there will be that we, I'm going to obtain. These are the two basic proceedings of protein engineering. So I can either obtain some knowledge by structure prediction, by um, experimental structure elucidation, by an enzymological characterization, um, by comparison to other enzymes, and then I achieve an hypothesis, and on basis of the hy hypothesis, I change on the rational basis some place, some sites of the enzyme, or I can proceed in an um, um, I can proceed with a um, molecular optimization algorithm in which I couple a random mutagenesis to a high throughput screening. And in the following, I would like to give um, examples for both uh, proceedings. The first example is arulmalina decarboxylase. So this decarboxylase accepts malonic acids and substitute malonic acid, aryl, um, with, 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 with alpha aryl, alpha methyl, substituent, and cleaves carbon dioxide and produces the resulting propionic acid derivatives in high optical purity. So this enzyme accepts many different compounds. So they can be like different aromatics. They can be here also a methyl group or an, 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 an H or an, an halogen. And uh, the products of these enzymes are interesting because several of them are a painkillers. So like non, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs there widely used over-the-counter drugs here, for instance, like naproxen, and they're produced in thousands of ton scale, and the market is in millions of euros. So this makes the synthesis of these compounds highly interesting. The problem is that the biologic activity lies in the S form, and this enzyme only produces the R enantiomers. So this is an asymmetric synthesis, so this means a prochiral substrate is converted to an optical pure product, and it would be very interesting, of course, to use this enzyme, but it produces the enantiomer, which has not the desired activity. The reason lies in the mechanism. The enzyme cleaves carbon dioxide from the malonic acid, and always cleaves here. This one's called the pro-R group, so this one's sticking to us. And then we get a planar intermediate, and to this, a cysteine adds a proton from one side. So this addition from one side only produces here the iron enzyme. So of course, if we could reason now, what if we would shift the cysteine to the other side? So this is a typical rational, and for this we need site directed mutagenesis. We need to be able to remove the cysteine here and change in another amino acid which would lie on, on the other position of the active site and which would allow us to attack on the other side. So this brings us to site directed mutagenesis. So, and in this, we use our DNA fragment encoding our enzyme, for instance, the, um, the arulmalina decarboxylase cloned in the plasmid vector. So this is for amplification in E. coli. And here you see, for instance, we have here a G, which binds to C, and we want to substitute this. So we separate the strands, and then we use a so-called primer to initiate um, an amplification. So a polymerase always needs a starting molecule. And to kick off the DNA, uh, the DNA polymerase, we need here a, a, a three prime, and we need a free um, OH group. And we use here a so-called primer. And this oligo has the same sequence like our gene, but differs in one um, base. You can also differ in two bases or three bases. Because of the complementary binding of the other bases, it still binds to our plasmid. And then the polymerase amplificates this uh, the DNA, and we get a copy of our plasmid having our mutation. Then we use a restriction enzyme that degrades methylated DNA. So this plasmid comes from E. coli, and E. coli is methylating DNA. So DNA isolated from E. coli has methylation on some sites, and this enzyme recognizes this methylation and only degrades the methylated DNA um, this this um, PCR product here was produced in vitro and it's not methylated, so it is not affected. So we 
uh, degrade the original template. And then we um, produce the other strand with a second primer. And then we have our mutated DNA already cloned in the plasma vector. And this can be done, so it takes two or three days to all the primers, and it takes another two or three days to make this experiment, So, including a quality check, so we sequence this. So this shows how easy it is nowadays to, to introduce mutations into um, enzymes. So we have here mm, the cysteine should be substituted, and this was done in a, here, in a, you can read here the original reference, this was done by a Japanese group, by Kenji Miyamoto and Hiromichi Ota from the Keio University in Yokohama. They substituted the cysteine with the serine because the serine is isoelectronic. And then on the other side of the active site, they changed in glycine to a cysteine. So now the um, serine will, has a very low activity in protonation and the cysteine is a very efficient protonator. So now they brought the cysteine to the other side of the active site and indeed, they obtained the S enantiomer. So this is a very classic rational design. There's a rational here to say the protonation comes from one side. We can ship this to the other side. And there were two mutations generated. So simply, simply double mutation, knocking out the serine with an isoelectronic but less active serine, and knocking out the cysteine and substituting it with the serine, and, sub and substituting a glycine to a cysteine. Uh, and it worked. The problem was the S-selective variant had an 18,000-fold reduced activity. This is also a classical problem of enzyme engineering, meaning that um, they did not anticipate that this cysteine also had an influence of activity. And this simply is, in this case, selectivity was understood very well, activity not. This is a typical case. So one aspect was understood very well, the selectivity. Activity was not understood. And therefore, direct evolution presented itself as a choice, method of choice, to improve now the activity. And about this, I want to talk in the next video. So to wrap it up, rational protein design fine, allows the rapid engineering of catalytic properties if we understand them, if we have a workable hypothesis, and also if we have, to be honest, if we have a bit luck, because rational protein design is very limited by our understanding of enzyme catalysis, and this is still very limited. So in the next video, I will present now the alternative directive enzyme evolution. Thank you very much.